in a wide array of speakers and panels that are going to scare us a little bit more about security and things we should worry about, but also to give us some things we should relax about and just think of things in a different manner. So I think it'll be a lot of fun and engaging conversation. And Thornton is totally in the pink for spring. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Thornton. So socks actually match the everything else. All right. well, good, good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. For those of you who have not been, this is uh, this is the Olin Innovation Lab Nine. We do the, we, we do this thing. Ten, ten, ten. It's ten. My God, it's ten. I lost one. I, I lost one. I lost one. So Olin Innovation Lab Ten, right? So we do these twice a year, right? Type of thing. And it's a it's a wonderful. Uh, I'm actually a classically trained cultural anthropologist. It is not just a seminar or a symposium or whatever that. Uh, it is a, it is the post-industrial campfire. And what we do is we bring it together. So we bring together this unique group of people. You are a curated audience, right? You know, basically because you are high intellect, high attitude, high maintenance. But uh, but, uh, <laughs> but 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 basically, they, they, it is an intellectually carnivorous group. So it's, it's it's a very very interactive group, if you will. And so historically, we sometimes we start with an exercise. And one of the exercises we have used is we said like, which moment, uh, basically which historical moment most closely replica uh, or, 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 or resonates with the one that we are in now. Right, type of thing. And so, and and w there are those who would argue that the moment that we are currently in most closely uh, resonates with the Enlightenment. All right, and I don't know if whether you remember the, the Enlightenment, but it was an amazing period of time. I actually wrote this down. This is actually from the, <coughs> excuse me, the Humanity Scholar, the Humanity Scholar's Clay Jenkins, and he was talking. It's an amazing moment in the history of the world when humans thought they were up to it when humans thought they were up to it, and that everything could be known, and that we could improve everything and that reason was going to be our oracle and that science would be our guide. That's what they, that, 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 was, the, that was the enlightenment. All right, so like, let's go back 10 years. 10 years ago, in security, no one thought the security ecosystem had anything to do with enlightenment. It was a gong show. And this is when I first bumped into our next speaker, Bill Malik. And he, he was in, in, in the face of, it was white hot, bags of money were being spent, it was critically important, and nobody knew anything about what was going on except Bill. He was a voice of, of a, an eloquent voice that was calm, understandable, and actionable. Right? You know, and I have been trying for 10 years to get him in front of a podium of people that I care about. Right? I think he, he is a tribal elder. He's still a young guy, but he's a tribal elder. Knows things, knows people, and he's going to share some of his insights. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in joining him, welcoming to our podium, Bill Malley. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, and it's interesting to reflect upon Thornton's remarks because he complimented me for three things that are not true about me. Um, however, uh, I am a wide speaker, so we have that, uh, that to go. Um, we're going to talk about things you should and shouldn't worry about, primarily in security, but I'm going to look at some other places. And I'm going to go a little bit beyond the typical, you know, here's, here's, the, you know, here's how heart bleed works kind of stuff. I mean, we can, we can talk about that, but you know, there's, Sands has a nice webcast and so on. Um, William Gibson, uh, anybody know who William Gibson is? Yes, of course. He invented the word cyberspace in a novel called Necromancer back in, uh, Neuromancer back in 1982, yeah, something. Anyway, um, so he tells us that we're already here, and this, this, by the way, is very important. If you take a look at any historical period and you say, where are the people living now? In that period, you'd say, well, it looks like they're on the verge of this or on the verge of that. Well, the fact is that the change doesn't appear everywhere at the same time. Uh, there are still significant portions of the human race that haven't quite made it through the agricultural revolution, which is a real uh, challenge to some of us. So there are, um, to, uh, to paraphrase th um, uh, Thorstein Berblin, this is the um, leisure of the theory class. Okay? Uh, we're going to take a look at the future. We're going to take a step back from the trees. Uh, take a look at the forest and come up with a map. And when we talk about maps, this is our agenda. Right? Uh, what is this thing? It's about two and a half inches long. It's made out of um, the horn of a um, reindeer. And if you take a look at it, it's got these little niches carved into it. Now, people tell me uh, who should know this sort of stuff that in order to make those little notches in that, you have to use five different tools. This, this isn't just something that fell down. Somebody spent a lot of time making this. And if you take the time, uh, but, but a, little, a little before SAP, okay, uh, um, you'll notice that there are 56 of those little things. What they are is they're phases of the moon. This was the thing that led 
the leader of the tribe to decide when it was time to go look for the fish, when it was time that the animals would be migrating, when it was time to stock up something, when it was time to find a nice warm cave. This also told you when the seeds should be planted, and it also told you, I guess if you wanted a boy or a girl, no, I think that was 25,000 years later. But um, <laughs> the point is that this, this is an early, early artifact, and it's really early. We're talking over probably 30,000 years. So at least 20,000 years before there was written language. And this thing was found in central France, and since it was found about eight years ago, they found two more. So this was the um, apple <laughs> of its day. Okay? This captured knowledge in a way that, until we got the myths of the stars, which became the, uh, the classic Roman uh, Greek myths, this was, this was knowledge. This was the most important thing you could hold. And it's a map. So um, I'm going to try to help you enhance your maps. Um, we're going to step back from the trees. Um, the arc of my career, I started out writing COBOL application code here in Boston. Went to IBM, started working on systems, wrote code, did testing, did test planning, business planning. Uh, was at IBM for 12 years. Went to Gartner for 11. I started the security service there and did our first conference. In fact, in 95, they're celebrating uh, the 20th uh, anniversary uh, of that. Um, and then I went out and did some consulting. It was CTO and since then I've been an independent consultant. Um, what we're going to try to do is find a serviceable plan and the only serviceable plan that works for you is yours, not mine. Right? Somebody would call me at Carter and say, can you send me an, a security policy? I say, no. Why not? Well, for the same reason I can't send you an org chart. Right? I mean, if it's going to be meaningful, it's got to be very, very specific. Generic ones are not going to tell you anything at all. So what we're doing here is applied futurology. And this is taken from a guy named Peter um, Schwartz, who was the head of strategic planning for Shell. His claim to fame was that the team using this methodology um, foresaw, in a, in a sense, the collapse of the Soviet Union. They used uh, these five buckets as sources of change. You could use different labels if you wanted. The idea is to have where places you can collect information and say, OK, these things seem to be social. The, the methodology to go into detail is you, you try to find um, critical uncertainties from two of these, and then you do a two-by-two two matrix on it. So you look at something in the social area, very good, very bad, critical, something's going to change your business. Then you pick something, say, from the political um, domain, good, bad. You come up with a four-by-four four matrix, come up with scenarios, give them names, and that allows you to sort of future-proof your plan. Okay. What if government goes far to the right, take a line from Mort Saul, my right is your left, which is what's wrong with this country. Uh, and what if the environment actually goes downhill? Well, now you've got some interesting potential questions that might impact your business. So what we're, we're not going to go through that. We're just going to go through some of the high level stuff. And if you want more, the art of the long view is a great uh, thing. And at the end of the uh, pitch, I actually have a, a list of references. So two of the social drivers for change at a high level demographics. Um, we've got more new workers. They have a different peer group. They look to different individuals as um, a reference group. They don't inherit values from their parents in the way that um, kids do from their parents in generations past. If you wanted to know what happened to the voting patterns in the United States when they lowered the voting age from 21 to 18 back in the 70s, it turned out that nothing changed. The kids voted exactly like their parents voted which was, you know, everybody said, well, wow, wait a second, that was, the, that was the end of the hippie generation. Wouldn't that have been a radical, it was not a radical anything. What is radical right now is that folks are talking to people in different parts of the world. Folks have closer relationships with individuals they've never met, but only read about, that they follow on Twitter or Facebook or you know, whatever the latest one was. And that's, and that's the peer group that's going to be coming into your workforce. And then at the same time, your experienced people are hanging on a lot longer. I mean, I had the good news when I was at IBM that uh, my boss came in and said, well, we changed the policy. You can now work till you drop. Yeah. <laughs> right. They did away with the retirement age. Why? Well, I'm supposed to one, And I still am actually pretty uh, facile. I mean, at least, you know, skillful enough to keep a, a day job. And so I'm not going anywhere, which is great. But what does it mean for the people who are waiting for my spot? And what does it mean when life extension kicks in? 
my kids are probably going to make it to about 120 to 150, their kids to 180. What it would be like to work for somebody for 90 years. <laughs> right? I think we'd all become entrepreneurs, and we'd all be the only persons on the planet, right? I mean, there comes a point where you just can't put up with it. So um, we want to take a look at how we can harvest that experience, how we can capture that knowledge, how we can sort of propagate the values without trying to indoctrinate folks. Um, and to drill down to something very specific in terms of social drivers, um, kids globally tend to think of information differently than we do. And that's because they grew up with it in a way differently than we do. The analogy that brings this to light, I heard a wonderful presentation on Beethoven, uh, WQXR, I live near New York City, and they were running a week on Beethoven. They said the difference between Beethoven's piano music and Mozart's was that the piano was invented when Mozart was already composing. Beethoven grew up with a piano. Beethoven grew up with the iPhone. And so he knew how to do things with it that would never have occurred to Mozart. And that always, that solved a big problem for me because Mozart is the best, I think, and yet Beethoven's piano concertos just, they go somewhere else. And that's why. Because they understand it at a gut level. So what does that mean? Well, here's a handy thing. Um, I'm going to make the assertion that anything that's a security bug is just a bug, or it's people misbehaving. So how do you fix that? I'm going to make a point about quality in a second, but if it's about people misbehaving, here's a free information security audit tool. Just imagine somebody in your organization, and she sees someone who's doing something wrong, maybe. So the three questions you ask this hypothetical employee, would she know it's wrong? Would she choose to report it? And if she were to pick up the phone, would she know who to call? If the answers are yes, yes, and yes, you're solid. But if she's not sure it's a security problem, or yeah, it, it looks like a problem, but I don't want to make waves, or I go to my boss, and my boss says, well, probably you're right, but you know they're in another area. Or they, they break through that. They say, gosh darn it, I'm going to call you to call the security desk. And they say, I think there's a security problem here. And the security desk says, is there a fire? <laughs> you know. Oh, you need to dial that number. And after a couple of steps of you know, that kind of nonsense, they, they give up and you're dead. And again, it doesn't matter what technology you deploy. It's, it's here uh, that's going to do it. So, so think about what values your people are learning, what you're portraying for them. When I was at... Uh, uh, at IBM in the 80s, we had a new lab director, and he said, because some, somebody had walked off with some platinum, they have bars of platinum in the Fishkill facility, and those things were 50 grand at the time, and one walked out. So he said, I want badges on everybody. Everybody's got to show their badge. If you're not wearing your badge, I'm going to challenge it. I was like, oh, okay. So I'm walking down the hall, and here comes Jimmy Canavino, and he's not wearing his badge. <laughs> Career-defining moment. I walk up to him lab director. I've known him since he was a third line manager. I said, hey, bud, can I see your badge? And he goes, thank you very much. He puts his badge on and he hands me a $20 bill. Guess what happened? <laughs> How many people did I tell about that that day? I can't count. How many people did I run into? Plus three. Uh, the point is that by the end of the week, people were challenging everybody. Excuse me, miss, I've got to see your badge. Uh, it's in my purse. Well, just get I need to see it. Honey, I made you breakfast. I understand, but I still need to see your badge. We got a reputation as being nuts. It's possible to get the right behavior without dropping a hammer on someone. Yeah, yeah. So use that for them. Second one, technological drivers of change. It's easy just to think of this in terms of IT technology, and that, of course, is a big part of it. But I'll tell you what. Um, they have a maker lab in the New Canaan Library. Okay. There's this little box. You know, it's not much more expensive than a color copier was about 20 years ago. And there are people making little models of things. And it's amazing because some of them are eight and some of them are older than me. And they're playing with this stuff and they're making things and they're making things that can't be made any other way. Additive manufacturing pile the stuff up, wash away the whatever is supporting it, and you've got this structure that would be possible to carve. The um, vast number of tiny smart devices is another way of talking about big data without using the phrase. 
Um, there was a project running at MIT about how small could you make a web server. And at first it was called Matchbox, and then it was called Match Head, and now they're doing Smart Dust. Smart Dust, you just sprinkle it across the battlefield, and everything that glitters is a sensor. There is no surprise attack anymore. And what do you do with all that information? You, get, you take an MRI, I was working with some folks at Georgia Tech, 20,000 films, right? The, the radiologist comes in reeling a cart and says, well, the problem seems to, no, the problem's here. How, how do you absorb that much information? Well, when you're doing half millimeter slices, you need software to tell you where that are. And this gets into my code quality thing. Code quality is going to be a huge problem. Let's say that I had a um, heart issue. And so I've decided to put uh, half a million uh, nano devices into my bloodstream to monitor my circulatory system, take care of any clots. If uh, that code running those is six sigma, that means I'm going to suffer a stroke every six hours. It's got to be nine sigma if this thing is going to actually positively impact. Well, it's, it's going to be zero defect for very, very small values of zero. I mean, it's like you can't tolerate them. How do we get there? We've known how to write good code for almost 30 years, right? The uh, Carnegie Mellon Project, Software Engineering Institute, they know how to do it, but we just don't do it. And it's not inertia, it's a hard problem. I, I spoke with Craig Mundy about this. I said, why don't you do this, this, and this? And he said, well, it's hard. Well, yeah, but it's got to be done. <laughs> or, else, or else we're going to throw our hands up and say, well, you know, Internet commerce is no more secure than commerce over uh, CB radio. Right? And we're going to come to that decision to just walk away from it. There haven't been a lot of moments in history when you've actually seen a retrograde motion away in technology. This could be one. A couple of others. The Romans had roads all over the known world. They fell into disuse, especially in the Arabian countries. And the reason was the camel owners got the government to put up a tax on ox carts nominally for the preservation of the roads. The tax was such that it was cheaper to carry goods by camel than by ox cart. And so the roads fell into disuse. Another example, the Japanese had gunpowder and made handguns in the 16th and 17th century. They stopped using them because any idiot with a gun could take out the most skilled samurai. So the samurais got the government to raise the tax on guns to the point where they could only be used for ceremonial purposes. And that worked fine until Admiral Perry showed up in the mid-19th century, end of story. So the point is that we do sometimes walk away from technological advantages, and I'm, I don't mean to throw a rock at tax policy. The government does need the money. I really do understand that. But the point is that we have to be very careful about what, cho what choices we make and what, what constituencies we are um, uh, supporting. Continuous monitoring is cheaper to monitor all the time. Uh, when I did the first security conference, um, we were talking about capturing video images as opposed to taking pictures. Well, those of you who have friends in the banking industry or in the banking industry know that there's a site down in the middle of Long Island where you can see the live feeds from every ATM in the Northeast. Because it's cheaper just to run them all the time than to try to figure out when the shutter ought to go. And sometimes people do things inside of an ATM that you wouldn't expect. They have nothing to do with money. Well, they might have something to do with money, but they have nothing to do with getting cash out of the ATM, so it's quite amusing. Um, yeah, this is, this is my take on Oprah. Uh, this is the heart bleed thing. Um, the, it was a coding error that the guy created late at night on the 31st of December in 2011. He had a really great idea and he wanted to put it in there and it was really simple and so he just slapped that code in there and it went out in distribution in March of 2012 and it's been out there ever since. And what it is is I send you a message and I send you two length fields. One says how long is the message and one says how long is the data in the message. So I send you a four byte field and it's got one byte of data. And you will send me back one byte of data. And that's how I know that you're hearing it. It's the heartbeat mechanism. So the hack is I send you four bytes of data, 
I send you a message that's four bytes long, and I send you a data field that's 300, that's, I'm sorry, 64K long. And you go, okay. And you respond by sending me 64K of whatever it is starting at that buffer address. And that's how they do it. And you can do it again and again and again. And there's no logging. That's how Heart works. So everybody gets a new SSL. And by the way, Open uh, VPN has as well as Open SSL. Uh, economic drivers to change. By the way, I'm talking a lot. Questions? Interrupt me. So, I mean, this, this can. I'll go another 10 minutes. Sure. Yes. Yes. It is a culture. It has to do exactly with how you compensate folks for their work. Um, the uh, Roman uh, marshal, right? Roman satirist, poet. He said, a slave who has three masters is a free man. Right? If I am being driven to high quality code, on budget, on time, I'm going to optimize against what will get me the best result. And if you're living in a SEI culture of two or one, those are in conflict. Once you get to three or above, they actually work together. But getting them from two to three is extremely hard. I worked I was through that at the Poughkeepsie Lab. Uh, in, 2000, in 1978, uh, SP1, the old MVS, had a defect rate of 1.4 defects per thousand lines of code. And the operating system was about four million. Right? So with every copy of MVS you got, free from IBM, you got another 5,600 bucks. No extra charge. Not acceptable in a system that's used like ZOS is now. Um, over a period of three years, we introduced the uh, software testing methodology. The code quality of the MVS operating system, its successor ZOS now, is less, fewer than one defect per million lines of code. And the interesting thing about that is we're using the same people, we're writing in the same language, we're running the same test cases. The only thing that's different is the process. The only thing that's different is the process. I wrote, among other things, the page fault front end for MVS. That code shipped in 1984. It has not broken since. Because I said, here's how it's going to work. I wrote it down. I put it on the screen. We had five people in the room. And if any one of them had any question, I threw it out and started over. I'm, this isn't about me. This is about the process. Because when you're sitting in a room with four people who have collectively more than a century of mainframe system program expertise, the appropriate attitude is humility. Like, how can you help me try to get this right? Because making silicon behave is tough. So um, when we get to the uh, economics, did I answer your question? Okay. Uh, a, a cloud, a public cloud is problematic. I wrote a, an article that was published in the Enterprise Media start of this year. The idea behind public cloud is you can't afford to put up your own system, but I can rent you some. I mean, the theory is Amazon, Google, they have 10 million servers, and they're 98% utilized, which means at any point in time, they've got 200,000 servers that aren't doing anything. Right? So the CFO says, eh, can you figure out, he says, I know, we'll rent space. That's, that's, what, that's the business case for public cloud. You already have 10 million servers. Right? The guy who can't afford to buy one of those things on his own will be happy to rent it. But what happens to the price of a server every year? Have any of you ever chided your predecessors for signing a five-year DR contract? <laughs> exactly. Wow, this is a great deal. 40% off list price in year one. Year two looks like a wash. Year three, it begins to look boring. Year four and five, it looks really uninteresting. That's, that's, what, that's why public cloud is going through a very short moment in time. I think another three years and it'll be history. The only people who can afford to do public cloud are people who already got 10 million servers. Um, so, but you'll do it because it's virtualization. Um, when it comes to consolidation, again, economic drivers, there was a time when land was cheap and we put data centers near people, telecommunications was expensive. That's flipped. And with speeds and volumes, it makes more sense just to have, I mean, Watson was right, there are going to be five computers. Right, one in Asia, one in North America, and we're gonna have this incredible network. 
and we're going to float data and float programs to those processing hubs because that'll be the cheapest way to do it. But how do you consolidate internally? First thing, you want to make sure that you've got the same set of um, rules governing that expense. Um, two people, each running their own kingdom, are going to have a very hard time deciding which one of them is going to give up their job. Okay? So you need to have go governance in place. Then you do footprint consolidation. You've got everything in the same place. Then you do virtualization to do image consolidation, cut the number of instances of stuff, and then finally workload and data. And that's extremely hard. By the way, you get a big bump from doing this. You get a huge improvement from doing that. But the improvement here is quality. Quality, service levels, response time. Well, um, cloud is the latest version of the answer to how come IT is so expensive. Right. And it's, it's just a new version of, of outsourcing. And I'll tell you about outsourcing. This is really important. There are two important points to be made, and this is the first one. I'm going to use an analogy. I went to my doctor, and he told me that I needed to lose weight. And I said, great, how do I do that? He said, well, two things, eat less, exercise more. And I said, okay. I thought about it. And I took a look at my core competences. And I realized that eating less was something within my abilities. But exercising more, there are people who can do that better. So I, so I outsourced. Yeah. I send a check for $71 to the health club every month, and I haven't lost a damn pound. Those guys aren't doing their job. That's outsourcing. And cloud is just the latest form of outsourcing. Cloud is not a new technology. It's a new way of putting together old technologies. It's not faster than stuff. It's almost as fast as stuff. The reason cloud's appealing is because somebody else is worrying about the complexity. But you pay for somebody else worrying about the complexity. Remember the big outsourcing deal? I think it was um, IBM outsourced them. Yeah, they outsourced, I think it was, yeah. There was the Xerox one, and then there was the IBM one with one of the banks. Yeah, and, and they ended up paying through the nose to get that job because they wanted to have a premier customer. IBM did the same thing. I think it was, oh, every year, every year. And, and the same thing with the, um, the bank in New York that IBM bought. Uh, they ended up giving it back <laughs> because the team was already quite efficient. IBM couldn't achieve any additional scale, so there was no way for them to get savings, so they said, sorry. Here's a check. Here's your money. Um, so, <laughs> well, um, one of the nice things about cloud is you don't see it when individual servers break. Right? It's, it's virtualized, you get dynamic motion, VM, uh, VMware is getting smarter about moving things around, and other vendors as well. Um, it's
Right. And again, if you have the governance, you can make that happen. But as long as there's a group that says, I want my data on my machines, yeah, you can virtualize them, but it's still going to be my data on my machines, you're going to be capped. And the problem is that with, with process utilization, unless you're a mainframe where 102% means you're doing pretty good, right? Um, in most cases, it's like disk. You know, if it's 50% full, it's full. Uh, on a PC, if your hard disk is half full, get a bigger one because you're just about done. Um, but yeah, yeah, cloud. Um, when I learned that um, virtual switches in cloud run in promiscuous mode, it was like, <laughs> this is like a PC LAN all over again. I can see every tra all the traffic if I just figure out what to look for. That's nonsense. Who thinks of this stuff? Right. Well, people who want to get a quick buck with it, easy solution. <laughs> Oh yeah, for a buck an hour. You know. No, it's actually free for the for the you know, for the particular low exercise right here. We can we can start a company mm -hmm. and go to production and come globally and have our own dedicated customer and help train them. Yep. Not as quickly as we have to train them. Uh, and and that's the reality. I mean it's not a trick or anything else for us to help them train them. Well, the, the capacity you need in order to create that environment is going to be a function of the number of test variations and environments you're trying to serve. Um, so the question is, what kind of a PC can you get for $800? And that is a time-dependent function. I mean, 10 years ago, you know, when I was in college, it was an HP calculator. <laughs> okay, where's it going to be 10 years from now? I mean, 10 years from now, the PC you have is going to have not just Netflix, it's going to have every movie that's ever been made on it. Because it's cheaper. Right? It used to be that phone companies would track your calls. They gave up. It's more expensive to track your calls than just say, okay, make a call. And we'll just give you a flat rate for the month. Because the cost of the underlying technology is dropping through the floor. That's why IBM got out of PCs. <laughs> we found the optimist.
<laughs> I, I, I want somebody. Yeah. All right. The, the, the only pitfall is to make a tactical decision and then have it become strategic just by the passage of time, right? Um, we had, when I joined Gartner, there were 500 employees. Uh, Ten of them were cooks. We had our own cafeteria. Right? Gartner got to thousands of employees and they outsourced to, I think it was ARA services or somebody because it was more cost effective. Right? You're going to go the other way. You know, there's, sometimes you're going to have an executive chef and you get to be really good right, for the super, uh, super so yeah, it, I, and with regard to SaaS versus cloud, the only thing I say is that I'm kind of comfortable with the um, NIST definition of cloud, and SaaS usually doesn't have, in, in some cases, doesn't have uh, pay as you go. In some cases, it's a flat rate. Um, I, I did the Gartner Magic Quadrant for uh, IT Help Desk, and there's a company, uh, ServiceNow, that um, basically you pay for a certain number of seats, and at the end of the quarter, or the end of the year, they'll true it up. But if I want to put somebody else on there, I just put them on there, and I'll get it at the end. So it's, it's not really that carefully metered. And that does get to the whole cost recovery thing, which is a point that I'm going to make uh, in a couple of slides as well. But you, you're quite right. It's, it is very mushy. It's very um, ill-defined. So that's why I kind of rely on that. I mean, for me, cloud is about virtualization over the internet connection. It's pay-as-you-go. It's um, um, multiple, multiple users hosted uh, concurrently. Just off the top of my head, I'm by the fifth. But th the point is that that's, that's, that's a nice working definition of cloud. SaaS doesn't often fit all of those things. Um, okay. Economics of information security. Um, security is about economics. If it's easier to, if, it's, if it costs less to get than it's worth, it's not safe, period. Uh, when I was in school, I lived in Boston. A uh, neighbor of mine had a nice stereo, it got ripped off, so we got to replace him through insurance, they put this amazing lock on his door. <laughs> they stole the lock. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, there comes a point where you say, okay, at, at, at some point I, I'm going to just say I can't protect this anymore. Um, the uh, commander of the U.S., uh, I think it was the Fifth Army in Korea, told me that if uh, he were the North Koreans, he wouldn't send a million people through the DMZ. He'd kidnap the families of five or ten operators computer operators, and that's how he'd conquer this thing. Um, the cost of a breach, just this is just something to think about. Um, how much does a breach cost? It's an act of God, you can write it off and so on and so forth. But the fact is, if you lose 50 grand, are you taking that out of revenue or out of profit? If it's coming out of revenue, eh, you're a $10 million business. But if you're a grocery store and you're a $10 million grocery store, that represents a huge chunk of your annual profit. Are you going to get it back in a day and a half or a month and a half? So think about the impact from, if you, if you need to get into a cost justification for information security, think about it as being revenue that's being taken out of your pocket. I, I just spent 
um, a delightful month rereading Adam Smith's um, uh, Wealth of Nations. He's really funny. And if somebody who's read Wealth of Nations comes to you and says about the pin factory, congratulate them for making it to the top of page two, because that's where that example is. If you go a little further, he says some things that, you know, garden the wool hardcore right wing capitalist types would probably not like to hear about management colluding against workers and so on. Um, anyway, um, and don't worry about risk quantification. I majored in math. When you have a tiny estimated quality and you're multiplying it against a huge estimated quantity, the result is indeterminate. It's not a question of how many significant digits. There are none. There are zero significant digits. I cannot tell you what the risk is or the chance of breach. What are the odds? What are the odds that there's going to be an earthquake that's going to cause a tsunami that's going to knock out three power plants? It doesn't matter what the odds are. Anything that's not prohibited is mandatory. Um, so you need to think about it in terms of protection of assets as opposed to saying, I'm going to put a shield over Yankee Stadium just in case a meteor or a jet plane falls. Um, environment, just for the sake of this discussion, I'm going to say, let's say there is global warming, so you want to go green. Uh, United Technologies rebuilt their Newington data center mainly because they had power problems. They used their own generators, but they paid list price for them, minus a 5% discount, which is what they give all their big customers. And because they're now co-generating, they heat the buildings from the generators, and they actually sell electric power back to the grid, 50000 a month. They did this just to showcase how well they could build a data center. They didn't expect it to be profitable after three years. And the other um, points, I, I'm, I can't remember if it was the First Bank of Boston or somebody else, but there was a group that spoke at CA World a couple years ago where they actually put a board level committee in place to solve the problem about IT spends bunches of money to save power and facilities rates the benefits. Well, they found out at this bank that if you put automatic power off on PCs, you'd save a million a year in electric. I'm sorry, you'd save three million a year in electric. The investment was $1 million. The board said, do it. It wasn't, it, it wasn't a budget buster. It was just, yeah, you get special money to do that, and they're now getting a $3 million annual savings just by turning off their PCs. Um, the Federal Data Center consolidation, I worked with a couple of guys when this was kicking off back in 2010. The biggest problem they've got is that the GAO can't separate power costs. So if you have five people in a building and one of them cuts their power consumption, they have no way of rewarding that one user. So it's, it's really stalled. It's a, yeah, it's a huge problem because they never put that level of accounting. Um, political drivers of change, uh, two of my favorite quotes. Uh, when Waveset bought Sun, we all sort of went, oh, well, Waveset plus Sun equals Sunset. Sorry, that was nasty. Um, Scott McNally had said, you don't have any privacy, get over it. And Eric Schmidt, uh, more recently, he's, he said a number of controversial things. But the most important thing is if you've got something you don't want anyone to know, maybe you should be doing it. Great. I mean, I don't even think my dad ever said anything quite that judgmental. Um, and here's customer satisfaction. This is about uh, environmental and economic things. How do you recover the cost of your data center? I like capitalism as opposed to flat allocation from the top. If I know what you want, and I can measure those things, and you can quantify the benefit to you, then I'll sell you the service, and you'll pay me what for a fair price. If I'm selling you what you want, and you're paying a fair price, we're aligned. Is there a better definition of alignment than that? Right? So the rule is don't talk about the cost of IT unless you're going to talk about the value of IT. Here's how you do it. This big square Venn diagram, the Everything on this is everything IT does. Here are the things that IT can measure. MIPS, consumption, megahertz, terabytes. Here are the things that users care about that IT does. There is an area of overlap. Anything that's both measurable and relevant, that's a service. There are things that are relevant that are not measurable. If this system were easier to use, I could be more productive. Oh yeah? How much? Well, I, I know I would be more productive. But the point is that if you're going to base your service level agreements on these things, some of them, not all of them, remember that the cost of all of that is going to be paid for out of these things. Ever wonder why automatic transmissions cost more than manual? 
manual transmissions are more expensive to make, they're more difficult to fix, and they don't wear as well. But automatic transmissions cost more because people like the convenience. The reason that most outsourcing deals happen is because first, the customer doesn't know how satisfied users are, right? And second, they don't know how much it costs. And an outsourcer will go to the board and say, I will be able to run this data center and I will tell you exactly how happy your users are, I'll tell you exactly how much it costs. And I'm not even gonna say it's gonna save you money. You may pay more than you're paying now, but you'll know what you're paying for. And people will take that deal. Now, how you measure customer satisfaction is a big uh, issue as well. We had a problem in the IBM lab around 1980. Um, folks were complaining about IT. And when you uh, left at the end of the day, they put up a survey. Question, was IT satisfactory today? Yes or no? If you typed yes, you could go home. <laughs> if you typed no, you got into a five-page dialogue. Was it this, was it that, would you, you know, 100 characters or more on this? And guess what? Three days, 100% customer satisfaction. <laughs> and these guys actually thought they were getting data. I mean, they had no idea that they were going about the wrong way. So if you're gonna do surveys, please get somebody who knows how to do surveys. Um, this is just an example. Intel's CIO publishes an annual report based on benchmarks, they say, for the various services, what's the quality and what's the cost and where do we rank against our peers? Now this was years ago. They do it internally still. I got this actually off the web. They were publishing this, they pitched it at a couple of um, conferences that I attended. And I think it's fairly informative. This, these are the things that the end users sort of care about. I mean, I might quibble about you know, some of these being really internal, but those, again, from IT's perspective, we're, just, we're providing a, a wide area network and we're providing it better than most of our competitors. And, and you can get this offline. So the other thing about customer satisfaction, um, back in the mainframe days, there was the Fred factor. Four out of every five problems that end users got were solved by other end users. One out of five, 20% of the problems end users got generated a call to the help desk. Now with PCs, it's nine out of 10. The traffic that goes through your help desk is 10% of the problems that people are solving for you, right? Now there's a philosophy about that. I know one organization where if a user reports a problem to the help desk, they open two incidents. The first is about the problem, and the second is about the fact that the user saw it, right? Okay, how many of you flew to get here? I'm not, you know. Well, if there's a problem with one of the engines and you notice it first, <laughs> that's not a good thing. <laughs> you would rather have the pilot find it and fix it before you even became aware of it. And if the pilot expects you to tell them about the problems, the pilot is inviting you to help fly the plane, even if you don't know how to fly a plane. Possibly, possibly. Um, so what do you do? Well, you can tell them not to do it, that doesn't work. Or you can give them tools and training. Now here's, here's the right way to solve this kind of problem. Here's the way that is architecturally conformant. Here's how we'd like you to do wireless. There are organizations in Canada that are still running major networks on Banyan Vines today because the IT people know how to do it and the users are happy. Now, they don't tell the real IT people, the IT people in accounting, the IT people in sales are running those things. Um, and then there's the old how much you're spending on maintenance. The, the general split is it's two to one. For every $2 you spend on keeping the lights on, there's $1 that goes to innovation and so on. It's a very soft number, it's hard to measure, but the, the general ratio is correct. And the message there is that if I can save $1 out of ongoing expenses, I've put twice as much on a percentage basis into the innovation bucket. And so how do I do that? Well, cloud, right? Done the right way, probably private, maybe public if you're early stage or you want it, you're bursting. You know, you're, you're a small website, but you, uh, 
you know, manage to win a 30-minute spot on the Super Bowl. You know, you probably want to get a bunch of cloud for that next 24 to 36 hours. So what, what's next? Um, how do your customers, employees, and social contacts change around you? Okay, I don't want to get, you know, soft and gushy about this. It's just, what are the, what are the areas that are changing? This gets into the demographic decision. What's happening? Um, yeah, how, do you drive the relationship with IT vendor? A vendor comes in and says, here's our architecture. And you go, wow, that looks good. Well, the vendor's in charge, right? The vendor comes and says, here's our architecture. And you say, no, no, here's our architecture. The question is, can you conform to that? Do you support these security standards? Because if I don't have support for this security standard, I need to get a deviation from standards. And your name may not be on it, but I know where you live, <laughs> OK? If I take a, very, a deviation to get something on there, um, what do your customers think the value of IT is? How do you sell that? How do you sell to it? Um, how long will the cloud business plan last? What's the time frame? What's the horizon over which you look at that? Um, <laughs> in, an, in an earlier life, I actually had the uh, charming naivety to ask my boss at IBM, did we ever go back and audit that we actually achieved the savings that, that we booked in order to run this modification? And the guy said to me, you know, it was really hard for me to get this job. Why should I make it easy for somebody else to take this job? <laughs> right. So how do you justify that? Do you have a culture that says, okay, I spent 10 bucks to save 50. Did you save 50? Or did the fact that you were gonna save 50 mean you're a good guy and we want you on the team? Just be aware of what's going on. And um, change is inevitable, growth is not. Change can just be wandering around out in the toolies. Growth is directed change. And the idea behind here is to put together a map. But remember, the, the moment you begin a project is the moment of least knowledge about the project. Whatever strategy you have in place at the start of a project is the worst strategy that got you off the ground. I mean, you might hit a home run, but that's not where smart money goes. And so the, the warning friend of mine who's Eagle Scout, if the map and the terrain disagree, believe the terrain. Now, um, Here's some of the references. Uh, I met Jerry Glenn years and years ago uh, talking about futurology. If you're going to do futurology, and I did it for 12 years, and you make five-year predictions, um, you have to go back and say, how'd you do? My teams in the application group, integration group and the uh, software security services group batted over 800 on the five years that we were doing it. So we were, you, you get better at it. Not just because you make great guesses, but because you say, okay, here is the evidence I'm looking at. And here's the chain of reasoning that takes me from today to tomorrow. If I'm right, great. If I'm wrong, what did I miss? Where was the flaw in my logic? That's the only way I know to get better doing futurology. Um, I attached two pieces, which are other, other folks. Uh, that's me. Um, this was a Gartner CIO survey about important things from uh, six years ago. Uh, and this was Oracle's top concerns. I, I did send to Thornton uh, document that listed these things out. This is an example of, I don't even know what they're trying to say. Um, design and deliver the transparent enterprise as opposed to what? Um, customer loyalty moves in front. Where was it before? You know, it, make them love your company. I couldn't bear to put the exclamation point at the end of that one because that was just too much over the top. Um, I don't know how top concern about the Internet of Things turning your business upside down is something that the CIO can do something about. I don't mean to uh, jerk around Oracle. I'm just saying that when you get a list of these things, just put, it, put them down on a piece of paper, take time, have one of your staff people say, um, is this relevant to enterprise? Um, is this going to help our users? Is this going to make us money or save us money? And if the answer is no, say, you know, that interesting phrase, nice headline, but I don't know what to do with it. Thank you.